Hello and welcome to Encounters with Polish and Ukrainian Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. The Polish Sejm, or Parliament, has declared 2022 the year of Romanticism. So it is appropriate that we dedicate this last episode of the year to a great Ukrainian Romantic poet, as we dedicated episode 14 to the great Polish Romantic Adam Mickiewicz. Taras Shevchenko, who was born a serf in Ukraine in 1814, became a free painter and eventually the Ukrainian national poet and lived until 1861. He's the subject of this, our fourth special Ukrainian episode of the series. It's been about nine months since Russia began its three-day invasion of Ukraine, and Russia is currently bombing Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, the power grid, waterworks, and residential neighborhoods, perhaps in the hope that they will break the Ukrainian spirit of resistance as winter approaches. But for Ukraine, there's too much at stake. If they want to survive as an independent country with their own culture and language, victory is their only option. We had hoped that this war would not continue on as it has, but so long as it does, we will continue our Ukrainian series within the series, and we'll explore more Ukrainian and Polish Ukrainian topics in the next year. If you go back to the main encounters page linked in the YouTube description below, you'll find our previous episodes in the series on Yuri Androkhovich, Serhii Jadan, the Polish Ukrainian novelist Janna Swonioska. We've got Shevchenko on the agenda today, and we're making plans for Aksana Zabushko, Lesia Ukrainka, and the Ukrainian School of Polish Romantic Poetry in the coming year. Before we meet today's guest, I'd like to thank everyone who has been supporting and following Encounters with Polish Literature. If you like what you hear on the program, click the thumbs up down below. Ring the bell to get notifications about new episodes. Follow the playlist of all of our episodes in the description of the program. Leave a comment if you can, and please click the subscribe button to show the Polish Cultural Institute New York that you are interested and would like to hear more. Remember that your engagement re reinforces our position in the YouTube search algorithm and that your active response in one of these ways will help the program rise in the search rankings so that more people can find out about Polish and Ukrainian literature, its past and present here on Encounters with Polish and sometimes Ukrainian literature. Be sure to hang on and watch the credits at the end for some recommendations about where you can donate to support humanitarian aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war. Today's guest, George Grabovich, is the Dmitro Krzyzewski Research Professor of Ukrainian Literature in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Harvard University. Professor Grabovich has been Chairman of the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Harvard and Director of Harvard's Ukrainian Research Institute. He was one of the founders and president of the International Association for Ukrainian Studies and chairman of the American Committee of Slavists. He served as president of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the U.S. and is currently a vice president there. In 1997, he founded and since then has been editor in chief of the Ukrainian monthly Kritika, a leading intellectual journal in Ukraine. Since 2000, the publishing house of Kritika has produced some 150 books, particularly academic books in the humanities, many of them published jointly with Harvard's Ukrainian Research Institute, the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the U.S., and the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences in the U.S. Professor Grabovich has written on Ukrainian, Polish, and Russian literature, and on literary theory. His first book on Shevchenko, the Poet as Mythmaker, published in 1982, has been voted the most influential academic book of the post-Soviet period in Ukraine. His most recent publication is the two-volume Taras Shevchenko v Kritici, Taras Shevchenko, The Critical Reception, published in Kiev by Kritika in 2013 and 2016. He currently heads an international team of scholars working on a history of Ukrainian literature that is due to appear in 2023. In March 2022, he was awarded the Shevchenko Prize, Ukraine's highest award in the humanities and arts, for his series of articles on modernism and the poet Pavlo Tsuchina. Welcome, Professor Grabovich. Great to have you on the program to talk about Taras Shevchenko. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Let me ask you, since it's so rare for uh, literary scholars to make it into the news, um, I saw just uh, this past week that you were one of 200 people to be named specifically um, as someone who is banned from Russia. Um, Has this gotten into the way of your plans at all? Well, I I learned it from my friends. I myself was not informed directly by uh, any officials. Um, And... uh, I actually was congratulated by my friends for being in such good company um, because there are people like Timothy Snyder there and Ann Applebaum and uh, a whole bunch of American uh, um, diplomatic and uh, governmental officials, which I never pretend to uh, be part of. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't rate that attention. But um, but it was interesting, and uh, I think it is basically due to uh, Kritika, to the work that is being done by the journal Kritika that I um, uh, edit, I'm the chief editor of, and uh, w- which is also a publishing house in Ukraine, and uh, it's been very actively commenting on the war, of course. And I presume you probably had no plans to go to Russia anyway. No, no I had no plans to go to begin with. I find it a somewhat uncongenial country now. But um, yes, it was um, it was something of a surprise. And it's, it's basically um, something analogous to a stunt, I think, uh, to, uh, to show that they too can uh, put sanctions on people. Let's uh, start into our, our, our subject. Um, Taras Shevchenko is considered the Ukrainian national poet, and we, we've dealt with the topic of the national poet before um, in our episode with uh, Roman Koropetsky from UCLA about uh, Adam Mickiewicz. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you can, you know, since you've written a lot about this uh, topic, if you can say something about, you know, what is a national poet and and why uh, why do Slavic countries seem to have such a proclivity for having national poets? A national poet, first of all, is a, is a phenomenon that is, I think, universal in one sense, but um, it is not always a poet, and not every country probably has a, a, a poet that stands for, that is an icon of the whole nation. Uh, certainly in the case of uh, Mitskevich and uh, Shevchenko and uh, Pushkin uh, in Russia, uh, that is, is the case, but... Uh, and there are several others that are prominent in the um, East European world, if you will, uh, like Petefi in Hungary or uh, um, or such. But um, in general, it's probably not universal, but he's a national icon. I think in the U.S., the national icon is probably Washington or Lincoln or both of them. Uh, and then it, it begins to become problematic. In France, uh, there is no national poet. But there certainly is a national icon, and that is Napoleon uh, in the modern period and uh, Joan of Arc in the early modern period. It's a kind of a cathectic object uh, for uh, the nation or the collective as it becomes more modern, more aware of itself as a political nation uh, to uh, um, to cast a kind of uh, glow on a particular figure that in that uh, exemplifies the uh, not only the identity of the group, but the striving for that identity. In the Polish case, it was an instance of uh, Poland having lost its independence, having lost its uh, existence to the partitions. Uh, in the Romantic period, uh, Mickiewicz exemplified the uh, ability to harness um very large very powerful collective energies and to uh, uh speak for the nation and uh um that was a, a very prominent uh instance and i think in in several other uh sort of in the ukrainian case too uh it may have even served as a kind of a model Certainly the reception of Shevchenko was in many ways in Western Ukraine, especially under Austria-Hungary, because in Russian Ukraine, it was uh, uh, that whole process was, uh, was firmly uh, resisted by the state. Uh, Ukrainian language was banned, um, and uh, uh, as was Polish for a while too, uh, and uh, as was also uh, 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 Lithuanian um, and Finnish, um, uh, so uh, this was a, a concerted effort to to keep um, 
the national um, movement for uh, self-identification, for political uh, um, uh, articulation, um, uh, controlled or repressed. Uh, it didn't work. But only in 1905 did the Russian state admit that there is a Ukrainian language. Uh, before that, it was uh, simply um, denied. Uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, the uh, the role of the national poet is important because it it simply exemplifies the uh, the desire of the collective to be itself. Can we call the national poet a 19th century phenomenon? I mean, I was trying to think, well, why not Kochanovsky rather than uh, Mitskevich, for instance, or or is, uh, is Shakespeare a national poet? And I'm thinking, well, maybe Shakespeare is a national poet, but not until the 19th century, right? Well, no, Shakespeare is a national poet already beginning more or less at the end of the 17th century with the great time of troubles in uh, in England. Um, and uh, uh, also during the Elizabethan reign, during his own lifetime, he was already becoming recognized as the bard. Uh, but certainly by the end of the 17th century and and then into, into the 18th century and so on. And then, of course, for the Italians, uh, it is uh, Dante. And uh, that is a 13th century poet. You know? <laughs> we have, uh, we're have we going very back. So, so the question is, can you have a national poet before there is a nation, if, if you will? Right. Uh, and uh, it becomes complex. Uh, and I, and as, as you said, I, I devote some, some effort to talk about it not only as a particular instance of a particular literature, but also as a phenomenon that is to say, can we compare national poets? Can we see any common ground for them? And I suppose, yes, we can, but uh, but they're always, the, the specificities predominate. So maybe we can we can think more specifically about Shevchenko. You, you've sent me some translations um, and maybe we can we can look at them. What I would like to do is to, before doing that though, to just very briefly, um, uh, cast a kind of a, um, a summary uh, encapsulation of Shevchenko's career. Sure, um, yes, please. I'll do it. I'll do it very succinctly because obviously one can do a, a, a easily a lecture or a whole course on this, and and I have done so in the past. But basically, uh, Shevchenko appeared on the scene somewhat um, unexpectedly. He he had been freed from uh, serfdom when um, his um, friends and admirers uh, helped to gain his freedom by putting together a collection of money to uh, to do so because you know he was the property of uh, of um, of mr engelhardt from uh, ukraine a very rich landowner and uh, and semi royalty if you will connected with also the the, the polish uh, um, uh, uh, gentry or, or aristocracy, I should say. And um, uh, that is when Shevchenko in 1838 uh, became a student in the uh, Academy of uh, Arts in Petersburg. And in order for that to happen, uh, he had to have his freedom. But uh, curiously enough, uh, uh, the the way in which he became known was through his poetry. And he was already uh, preparing that, and his first publication he appeared in 1840, and it was called the Kobzar, the Minstrel, and it had a mesmerizing impact on Ukrainian um, uh, literature and Ukrainian writing. Um, and um, what is all particularly noticeable is that it was also noted by Polish and uh, Russian critics, especially his next poem, Haidemaki, which dealt with the uprising of um, um, uh, 1759 um, or 1758, um, and um, the um, um, uh, one of a series of uh, of uh, bloody events that contributed uh, or were were a kind of a preface to the first partition of Poland, um, and um, and then uh, in the course of the 1840s, he proceeded to publish more po or to write more poetry, but it was not published. For which, in 1847, he and a group of other young intellectuals in Kiev were all arrested as on, on the suspicion of being members of a secret society that was out to overthrow the government. Um, he um, actually had not participated or they had not done anything illegal. They were just thinking and talking about 
the abolition of serfdom and uh, the whole question of should Ukraine not have a certain kind of uh, um, freedom to develop? Because, of course, various other countries in Eastern Europe were uh, also undergoing a kind of renaissance, especially this the um, the uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, um, the uh, the peoples of the Balkans, and so on, um, the which culminated in the so-called Spring of Nations in 1848. Um, the um, the, they were all arrested, and Shevchenko got the most severe punishment because what was found in his possession was this collection called Trelita Three Years, which is basically poetry written between 1843 and 1845, which is very powerful political poetry. Political in the sense that it postulates the uh, independence of Ukraine, the, the fact that it may not have been always just an appendage of or a province of Russia. Uh, which is, of course, also historically true. Uh, and uh, he returned from exile in 1857. Uh, actually, he got to Petersburg by 1858. And uh, by then, he was already a kind of a star. He had been cast by all his well-wishers, by his Ukrainian readers, but also by many Russians and by many Poles, too, as a kind of uh, um, martyr for the cause. Especially, Shoshenko had very close connections with various Poles, Polish uh, prisoners of, uh, you know, political prisoners in in exile. Uh, especially people like um, um, uh, Brunisław Zaleski. Um, and uh, w- when he died in 1861, it was characteristic that there were many well wishers from not only among the Ukrainians but from among the Poles and the Russians who saw him as a kind of a national champion, a champion of uh, the battle against tyranny. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, is the, the the poet's career. Uh, actually, his his uh, time to write to 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 be free to do so was very brief. Uh, but he did write, even though he was expressly forbidden to write and to paint while in exile, he did write, and uh, um, and much of that was also prose, which was in Russian, as was his diary, also in Russian. But uh, for me, who am, I'm now writing a book on Shevchenko, uh, a kind of uh, belated effort to bring all of these various earlier works that I have written on him uh, into one succinct statement about him as a writer and as a figure. Uh, the problem that emerges is that he is not that easily, you know, um, pigeonholed. Um, the different forms of his creativity, his, per, for example, his prose as opposed to his poetry, uh, the prose is primarily written in Russian, has a different character, has a different sort of factura, a shape. Um, and uh, so also his painting. Uh, his painting develops from a kind of an academic and at times almost sentimental style under the tutelage of people like uh, um, uh, Brilov, uh, Karl Brilov. Uh, and, um, and then it emerges to a kind of very interesting, uh, um, I don't know, pre-modernist, uh, at times almost surrealist uh, painting that is... Uh, that is very, very interesting and hard to categorize. And then, of course, his life itself is not that unequivocal. Uh, but the the poem you mentioned is something that I um, I translated long ago. I think like ten or twelve years ago, and um, I think it's uh, it's a, it's an exile poem written about the the problem of writing, about why to write, and what what is because for 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 Shevchenko, exile was a period of. Uh, like the mystics say, the long night of the soul. It was um, um, a moment of uh, of great um, uh, anguish, of uh, isolation. Of uh, um, as the first three years were rather easy. Uh, he spent the time in Orenburg, and he had various friends and colleagues. But after it was discovered that he's actually still writing poetry, um, he was exiled much further east to what is now. Um, the eastern part of Kazakhstan on the Mangishlak Peninsula. And uh, this was a desert. It was really um, uh, a godforsaken place where he spent um, something like uh, six years and um, or almost seven years. And uh, um, this uh, the poem in question was written uh, somewhat before that, but it 
summarizes this searching for uh, 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 meaning in his own life and in his own uh, uh, and his own self esteem, if you will. While he's relatively disconnected, he doesn't have much co- correspondence with his friends. Or, or well, he's he... waiting for correspondence, and it begins with the statement, you know, perhaps I have to write this letter to myself. You know, something that ended up being repeated in American folklore as a pop song. People were discouraged from writing to him, but some did, and um, he kept up this correspondence assiduously. And now, I think the correspondence of Shevchenko is um, is one volume of a of a rather large five volume edition or six volume edition of his writings. Why don't you read if you like? I guess it must be up to me to write this letter to myself and tell it to the very end all what is needed and what's not. For at this pace, this sacred writ will never come from anyone, and no one's there for me to voice the holy truth. Although it's certainly high time. Ten years have passed since I first gave them my kobzar. And they're all silent like the grave. No peep, no censure, nothing. You'd think I never even lived. Uh, well, this is somewhat hyperbolic. Uh, he uh, he was receiving uh, 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 correspondence. Uh, people did not forget about him, but they were, of course, forbidden to officially write about him, that is say, in public. Uh, he could not be mentioned in public. And characteristically, between the time of the arrest of people like, and by the way, not only Shevchenko was arrested, but people like Kostomarov, a very prominent Ukrainian and Russian historian, uh, people like Kulij, Pantelimon Kulij, but their punishment was much more um, somehow moderate. Uh, they were just exiled to the provinces and uh, and kept out of the picture. And, uh, and uh, in about two or three years, they were allowed to return. Because actually they had done nothing. There was nothing that was uh, that was uh, uh, that could be uh, considered a kind of a seditious crime. Mm-hmm. But in the case of Shevchenko, he had been writing poetry that had been uh, uh, that was uh, anti against the regime. Uh, it had not been published. So in any normal country with a constitution, that would not have been a, a crime. It was just. He just wrote poetry for himself. But in Russia, <laughs> then and now, and uh, in the Stalinist period, this was always a great crime, a great sin. The very fact of thinking, and this is what Orwell intuited, the very fact of thinking wrong is already a capital crime. A thought um, crime. <laughs> yeah, it's a thought crime, precisely. And then and then, just, just to read a few more fragments, this is, and yet... I'll sooner get a posting to my grave from Russia's army, dear God. Uh, I'm sorry, to Russia's army. Dear God, at times my heart would strain to catch a word of wisdom so that I'd know, why do I write? For what? Why do I love Ukraine? Does she deserve this holy fire? Notice how frequently the term of the holy, of the sacred is is coming up, you know, because he senses that this calling is a a very important thing. It's not not, uh, for entertainment. Uh, which was, of course, true also for Mitskevich. Uh, in some peculiar ways, it was also true for, for Pushkin. Uh, but then at the same time, the culture that he b- was, grew up in was the one that valued light poetry and acriantic poetry, as it was, it was called. It, it valued wit and, uh, and eroticism. This is not the way in which uh, Shuchenko is constructing it, as you can see here. Right. And he says, uh, for though I'm getting on in years, I still don't know what I'm about. I use God's holy time to write, and sometimes sinfully I dream of Cossacks riding jet black horses. This is, of course, a somewhat, how should I say, skewed uh, statement about what he actually wrote, because what he did write in his poetry of the that period of the three years, 1842 to 1845, was revolutionary poetry. It was poetry that fully, totally, directly questioned the right of Russia to own these lands, to own these people, to be a despotic tyranny. You know, what what's what stronger, you know, statement? So this, in a sense, was, um, uh, I think, a greater sin than Byron's about, you know, writing about um, the, you know, in Child Herald or, in, uh, if you will, in, uh, in whatever, uh, uh, you know, the Byronic stance is was a dominant and very powerful model, but uh, Shuchenko is exceeding it. 
Nobody had come even close to this. Did fate decree this? Did my mother not pray to God before my birth that now a trampled viper in the steppe I ride and wait for sunset and for death to free me from this desert? And why? By God, I don't know why. And yet I love her still, my vast Ukraine. Although I wandered her alone, for as you see, I found no mate and blundered to my doom. And this is where the poem really takes a very curious and, and you know, uh, kind of a turn or void fas, you know, because it becomes a dialogue. It had been a kind of a, uh, you know, a letter to himself. It had been a, a kind of a rant, if you will, mm-hmm. about people not appreciating him, not loving him, not continually, you know, um, uh, attuned to him. And then he says, forget about it, friend, make do, encase yourself in hardened steel, and pray to God, for that is real. While all those friends, they're not worth spit. What do you expect from cabbage heads? But then who knows, compadre, you're no fool. Go work it out yourself. I have a suspicion that the word that he uses, which I put here in the in the uh, Spanish, compadre, you know, because it is like from a different language, but everybody knows what it means, is, uh, is a locution that probably he heard from his Polish friends in exile, because the way, the term that they very they very much often used, and he liked it very much too, was panie bracie. Mm-hmm. So it was both panie, you know, but bracie, you know. So it's like friend, colleague, or friend, you know, sir, whatever. Uh, it is a uh, it is a uh, it's a confession, and it's uh, and it's uh, a demonstration in a kind of a pre modernist way, but still already moving beyond the, I think his contemporary in Polish literature or the person that he would have had much common ground with was not the people of the time of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mickiewicz and Słowacki and Krasinski, but of Norwid, just about 20 years later, which is then that this is being written, that uh, uh, produces a new dimension of uh, questioning the role of writing and the role of the poet and so on. Um, And it's a poem that uh, he then crossed out. And it was not published in his lifetime, you know, but it is part of the legacy. And uh, it also demonstrates how complex that uh, legacy still is, because this is not the uh, unequivocal sort of self-confident, you know, prophet. This is the poet asking himself, "Why? Why am I doing this? For whom do I write?" Maybe we can look at one of the uh, one of the earlier poems. Uh, we're sort of working backwards and forwards. Chichrina, 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 which is uh, uh, refers to you know some of the more the things we're more familiar with from romanticism: the idea of ruins and decay, and um, the, the the indescribable past, and uh, you know, like thinking about uh, you know about his changing view, um, you know, on this you know this past and the future. I mean, it's this is maybe maybe more his grandfather's vision of uh, um, of Ukraine. The, this idea of you know, the old Ukraine that was, you know, at war with Poland and at war with Russia separately. Chihrin was the capital of uh, Bohdan Um This was a, a small town that then became uh, sort of like forgotten and bypassed by history. Um, but uh, this uh, exemplified, it was briefly, uh, uh, because in Mazepa's time, and Mazepa was the last, Cossack hetman of the of the so-called hetmanate uh, that was founded by at the time of Khmelnytsky and in, uh, in the uh, during the what became uh, the great war of independence or of national, if you will, uh, um, liberation against the Polish Commonwealth, uh, and uh, it started in uh, 1648, uh, just when the Thirty Years' War was ending in uh, in uh, Central Europe. And uh, and it lasted uh, until the, the Khmelnytsky's death in um, 1657, and then lasted for another 20 years as a series of uh, internecine fratricidal conflicts within the uh, Ukrainian hetmanate and the 
their relations both with Poland and with, let's say, with the Commonwealth and with Russia or Muscovy. And uh, it exemplified and was called in the Ukrainian historiography the ruin, the ruin. Uh, but uh, and Khmelnytsky uh, exemplified liberation for the for the Cossack uh, hetmanate, and uh, and he did establish a state. It was a, a semi-independent state. It became after he signed the Treaty of Pereyaslav with Muscovy in uh, 1657. It became uh, uh, something of a vassal state to Muscovy. Um, but uh, the last to try to break the hold of the of Muscovy of Russia was Mazepa in the, the Northern War, uh, and as you know, he lost in uh, 1709 and uh, was defeated by uh, Peter the uh, First in the Battle of Poltava, uh, and uh, that marks sort of the end of the independentist uh, period of uh, Ukrainian early modern history. But uh, Chihrin for uh, uh, for Shevchenko is uh, simply uh, a kind of a, a, a lieu de memoir, a, a, a place of memory, because it is that which was uh, a capital of a, of an aspiring state to be, which didn't happen, and uh, and this is a kind of a meditation on the past. It was written in 1844, and. Uh, um, uh, I think this is very powerful. Uh, pro- I mean, nobody in Ukrainian literature was writing like that. I mean, to to read this, uh, as his contemporaries then said, it made your hair stand on end. You know, uh, if you had been brought up to know that, and, and everybody was, to that th- thinking badly is the same thing as a sin, and a, and you're about to be imprisoned for it. Well, this was very bad thinking. So this is how it begins. It says, Old Shehrin, Old Shehrin, impermanence is your name, and fragments of your holy fame drift on like motes on chilling winds, dissolving into clouds. The years stream by, the Dnipro runs dry, tall burial mounds fall into dust, as does your former glory. And no one's here, my feeble Ulster, to say a word for you. And no one rightly knows where was it that you stood? Why you were even here? They cannot tell it even for a laugh. And then this about, about history. Why did we fight the Poles? Why did we smite the Tartar hordes? Why did our lances harrow Russian ribs and sow the fallen and water with blood and harrow with swords? What was our crop? Myrtle, periwinkle and the like, mere poison for our will. It's very hard to translate uh, idiomatic expressions uh, uh, f- and uh, words that rhyme and make sense in Ukrainian, uh, and uh, or at least can be inferred by the contemporaries. Um, uh, um, the words that he uses in Ukrainian is ruta, ruta, voli nashui otruta. Uh, that is to say. Myrtle and periwinkle are, are um, you know, herbs that are that have only beneficent um, uh, connotations. You know, periwinkle is an innocent little, you know, it, it is used and myrtle and so on. It is used for for decorations, uh, but this is seen as mere poison for our will because it is something that enervated the people. It contributed to their to their uh, passivity, as it were. And I, a holy fool, just weep in vain among your ruins. Amidst the weeds, Ukraine is fast asleep and covered up in mold. Her heart has rotted in the bog. She let the snakes nest in her innards, and the hope of children she just abandoned in the steppe to the mercy of the wind and the waves of the sea. This notion of a holy fool of the Eurodive, he has a poem by that name, is of course a reference also to Jeremiah. He has the insipid to that from the Bible, from the Hebrew prophets. And uh, he uh, he translates from this church Slavonic uh, the insipid of the uh, of the Old Testament of you know Jeremiah's lament, you know, about the holy fool weeping in vain among the ruins of Jerusalem for the people. 
Uh, so it's um, he is using very sonorous and resonant images of the poet as prophet. Uh, um, and then, you know, and then it basically ends with this, I too would like to sleep, he says. So he, he tells him, so sleep and folded by the shtetl, you know, this is, you know, now it has become a shtetl. It is, it is no longer that, that you know, Hetmanate is just a small little town. Uh, and says, my prayer said I too would sleep, but cursed thoughts just rush to set the soul on fire and tear her heart apart. Hold off my songs, don't burn it yet. Perhaps I still can grasp my fate, a true and peaceful word. Perhaps I still can forge for that old plow, a plowshare, and set the harness and try to plow my furlong. And on the sod I'll sow my tears, my heartfelt tears. And then this notion that from that, this is a classical image that, you know, from uh, the the myth of Jason and Medea, you know, of sowing the, uh, of sowing the dragon's teeth from which, uh, grow up, you know, uh, um, I don't know, monstrous beings or double-edged knives. You know, this is I've seen, you know, uh, various uh, uh, animations that depict it in this fashion. Perhaps they'll serve to grow a crop of double-edged knives that'll open up that fetid heart and spill the noxious blood and fill it then with living Cossack blood that's pure and sacred. This image of a kind of a, are you washed in the blood of the lamb is actually going back to the old, early New Testament um, imagery and hymnology, if you will, that later was repeated, for example, in black spirituals and so on. Poems like this, do they speak to the contemporary reader? I suppose they do. People in Ukraine have been brought up in school and, and they have been taught to interpret this. But this also requires a kind of a rethinking and a kind of a rediscovery of Shevchenko as a poet of many parts and, uh, and, and considerable complexity. In another poem that you, you sent me, um, if you young gentlemen but knew, uh, he, he addresses some of these uh, these issues of slavery. And, and recently, uh, uh, Maria Genkin from uh, from Razum for Ukraine, um, which is one of the uh, uh, organizations that we mention in our credits as as uh, a way to you know support uh, support Ukraine um, at this time I uh, said that uh, the Chevchenko was uh, kind of like the Ukrainian Frederick Douglass is that a fair comparison do you think Frederick Douglass as a kind of um, um, uh, activist and orator and I assume that's what she means, yes, and and, yes. and memoirist, perhaps. Yeah. Memoirist could be, uh, but he his connection to uh, black history is, uh, I think, most palpable in uh, in an uh, in a painting that he made. I mean, a, a portrait that he made. It's a drawing of uh, the well known at that time. This was in uh, 1859, I believe. African American Shakespearean actor Ira Aldridge. Ira Aldridge is uh, very highly regarded as a figure of uh, of Black history, and uh, and his and that portrait by Shevchenko is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington D.C. Uh, and uh, uh, it's it's you know it's attributed. It's not unattributed, but it's 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 a remarkable conflation. You wanted to for us to look at the Yegbivisnale Panici, yes. Sure. Yeah. And think about, you know, um, this, you know, it's kind of an anti-romantic uh, reflection on yes. slavery. It's, it's very, you know, it, very much so. It's it's a commentary on the depictions of country life and the, and the uh, ideal or the Eden-like life of the peasantry that is, uh, that is part of a, if you will, a sentimentalist poetics and, uh, which he um, takes very powerful issue with. And this is how it goes. He says, if you young gentlemen but knew how people weep their life away, you would not spin your elegies and praise God's name in vain while laughing at our tears. I cannot fathom why you'd call a peasant hut God's paradise. I suffered once in such a hut. My tears were shed there, my fierce tears. And I don't know one vicious thing in all God's world that doesn't nest there. But still, you call it paradise. I do not call it paradise, that little hut within a grove by a clear pond at the village end. 
edge. That's where my mother gave me birth and swaddled me and sang her songs and poured her grief into her child. And in that grove, that hut that was in paradise, I witnessed the hell. Slavery and endless work and not a moment free for prayer. It's a Philippic, if you will. It's a poem of, uh, and it's written in exile characteristically. This is written in 1850 or 1848. Let me see when, when is exactly, 1850, yes. Um, it's, uh, and, and, you know, and, and he sees it as such an obscenity, you know, and, and why? How can this self-glorifying uh, uh, state purporting to be religious and Christian uh, uh, endure slavery? Well, the same, of course, could be said of the United States, which purported to be one country under God with liberty and justice for all. I don't know when that phrase was coined, but certainly uh, it did not apply to... Uh, to uh, the uh, antebellum uh, South in, uh, in, in this country. And there from poverty and toil, my mother went to an early grave and weeping with his kids, we were all small and naked. Then my father died in serfdom. And we, we scurried round like mice to find some shelter. I went to school to carry water for the kids, my brothers to be serfs, that is till they were shorn into the army. By the way, Shorn into the army is uh, is literal. That is to say, shorn because they 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 would shear their locks, their hair. You know, so everybody had a, had a uh, you know, as they still do probably. Uh, at least we see it in in, in uh, movies about people in boot camp. But uh, but the difference is that now you if if there is a draft, there is no draft now. But uh, um, uh, Russia will probably institute a draft um, uh, to fight its war with Ukraine. Uh, but um, if, if it is, it's for two years, right? Two or three years. Then the term of service was 20 years. So um, if you went into the army, that was it. It was like a life sentence. In servitude, you all grew up. In servitude, you'll all go gray. In servitude, my sisters, you'll all die. And then, of course, it becomes an attack on God himself. And this is that what is what the present day Shevchenko reception has difficulties with, because he takes it to the edge. He sh this is what he said. This is here. Uh, you can see it. I shudder every time I think of that small hut at the village edge. Such are our deeds, O Lord, in this our paradise, thy righteous earth. We've made a hell of paradise, and now we beg thee for another. For after all, we love our brothers. We harness them to plow our fields, which we then water with their tears. And while I can't be sure, it even seems to me at times that thou, for it's thy will, O Lord, that keeps us stuck and naked in this Eden, that in thy heaven, Lord, thou art laughing just a bit at us and taking counsel with the lords on how to rule this earth. That is a very harsh uh, charge. Actually, actually, Mitzkevich was making it in his Jade uh, part three. When uh, in the battle over the soul of the of the prisoner of uh, Gustav, who becomes Konrad in uh, Jade, uh, you know the uh, he is on the verge of uh, saying that that God is a Tsar, not a beneficent Lord, and uh, that has to be then exorcised. I'm just making this little digression because that is maybe one argument to be used when talking about why Miskevich fell silent in his late last years. What do you think? I mean, in your uh, in your article that we were it's kind of the background of what we were discussing in the beginning from 2001 um, about the national poet. Um, you uh, mentioned that there are very few uh, deconstructionist or revisionist approaches to uh, Shevchenko. And, you know, now it's 21 years later, and I'm wondering if, uh, if there are such approaches. And then there's the other question of whether, like, maybe now is, a, is not, a, not the best time to deconstruct Shevchenko, that uh, in the context of, uh, of, of war, how do, how do we approach the national poet critically um, in an environment of uh, heightened and justifiable patriotism. That seems to be a per perennial state of affairs. I mean, now it's, it's, it's more, it's more uh, acute than ever before because Ukraine is, uh, is literally threatened with its very existence. If Russia wins, Ukraine disappears. 
It's simply no Ukrainian culture, no Ukraine, if it wins. And uh, it's only up to the West to, to make it not happen, which is not the, the topic of our discourse here, but I don't see how one cannot mention that at least Certainly. when saying anything relating to Ukrainian culture or Ukrainian literature. Because in this mad, uh, but it is not mad, it's more criminal than mad, uh, desire to ex- extirpate the Ukrainian Ukrainian nationhood uh, by calling it Nazi and uh, and uh, militaristic or what have you, as as uh, uh, Putin is claiming, um, we have um, an existential uh, and and basically genocidal war. Um, so yes, uh, I'm not asking for debunking of Shevchenko. I never did, even though uh, in my first book on Shevchenko, the poet is mythmaker. I I uh, strongly urged, and I still believe that this was the right tack to to look at his uh, creativity as being a form of myth making rather than of historiography, because he uh, he envisions a kind of a millenarian uh, uh, world. Um, that is the only vehicle he has for articulating the final liberation of the country. Um, now, obviously, there are other um, uh, tools and mechanisms, but um, the trial, um, well, and the short answer to it is that this um, deconstruction has to be done uh, with understanding and with uh, and with sympathy. Uh, but some elements need to be deconstructed. Because, for example, uh, 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 already as early as uh, 1876, that is to say, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he was already then an exile in uh, in, uh, in Geneva. The Ukrainian uh, uh, very important historian and thinker, uh, Mikhail Drahomanov, um, postulated that um, Shuchenko has been everything for everybody in Ukraine, that is. Mm-hmm. A monarchist, be they liberal, be they conservative, be they uh, Slavophile, what have you, everyone wanted to claim him. And he's saying that's impossible. You know, he was not something for everybody. He was, he had a particular, uh, f- you know, a particular profile and uh, factura, and that was. Uh, and that was, um, I think, uh, and one of the ba- basic reasons why it also contributed to his becoming um, the icon that he that he did become. Um, so anyway, this um, um, uh, he he questions the conventional um, uh, understanding of all authority as stemming from. God, and hence as a form of justifying even a reactionary regime like Russia's. Because, because this is how this, this is how it ends. You know, he says, for see the grove is bending in the wind and the pond beyond is like a canvas where distant willows calmly bathe their boughs. It's simply paradise. But look more closely then and ask what's going on in paradise. But of course, all happiness and praise. For all, for all, for thy holy, sacred self, and all thy wondrous deeds. But there's the rub. There is no praise. Just blood and tears and blasphemy. A curse on everything. No, there's nothing. There's nothing sacred on this earth. I even think that people now have put a curse on thee. This certainly flies in the face of the pietistic Shevchenko, mm. the dutiful Orthodox Christian. Of course, he was not. Mm-hmm. If anything, he was much closer, as Rahmanov argued, to the Protestants. That is to say, his religiosity was much more, much more Protestant than it was Catholic or Orthodox. Certainly not Orthodox. Uh, but, you know, that is still something that needs to be uh, read from the poetry. And it's, I think, uh, um, you know... Um, an element that is still with us. I th- I think that what I really would would like to argue the way I would argue it is that um, these poems still presumably can speak to us, uh, especially if they're done in an English. If you're translating, that is attuned to also the more contemporary idiom, which is what I try to do when translating him. 
Will we see these uh, translations published somewhere sometime soon? I've been doing it piecemeal, uh, and uh, it's been taking a very long time. I think I began doing it in uh, in about 12 years ago, uh, and by now a fair amount has been translated. But, uh, uh, you know, the one of the reasons that there is a kind of uh, – um, absence in terms of that kind of more concerted deconstructionist, if you will, or certainly more uh, enlightened, you know, reading of him is because uh, <clears throat> some tools of uh, of theoretical or you know, uh, um, um, as as you mentioned, deconstruction and postmodernist uh, thought um, have not been applied certainly psychoanalytic elements. So, yes, I think that there's there's much still to be learned. Can we take a look at his poem, uh, Zapovit, The Testament, um, which I, I thought, you know, I mean, something I, I usually don't talk about uh, where I'm broadcasting from um, here um, in uh, in Hawaii. But um, but something struck me about uh, about this particular poem that uh, that ties to you know the local um, self-conception of uh, of uh, Native Native Hawaiians and and people in Hawaii in general, which is the idea that uh, that there is life in the land. That uh, the, you know, if we look at the uh, the uh, the motto of Hawaii, the state motto, Uamau ke ea o ka'aina i kapono, uh, the life of the land is preserved in righteousness, uh, which was originally stated by Kamehameha the Third in 1843. Um, the time of Shevchenko, um, that uh, that there there's that idea that there's you know that the you know people should be in harmony with the land and that that's um, that that's uh, uh, that's uh, the sign that all is right in the in the world and I, I think that um, you know maybe the testament also makes that kind of argument. But this was written in uh, 1845 on uh, Christmas Day. That is to say, the, the Latin Christmas. Uh, that is to say, the 25th of December. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm sure that that had uh, uh, had some, um, you know, meaning for Shevchenko at that time. Uh, uh, it it became still already in the uh, late uh, 19th century a kind of unofficial Ukrainian national anthem. Hmm was put to music by, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, Lysenko, the Ukrainian composer. Uh, uh, but I'm not sh- sure of, of that. And uh, and it's uh, um, it's um, it is now uh, frequently sung as a kind of uh, as a kind of homage to Shevchenko and also a kind of reaffirmation of the Ukrainian spirit. And it, it, it is. And it's called uh, um, the Testament, uh, Zapovit, but uh, um, um, I don't think in the original it has that uh, that title. Anyway, so this is how, how it reads in, in the translation. When I am dead, then bury me atop a burial mound amid the boundless steppe and in Ukrainian ground, so I can see the distant fields, the Dnipro and his cliffs, and be close enough to hear his ceaseless rushing roar. And when he's taken from Ukraine into the deep blue sea, the blood of enemies, then will I depart the fields and hills and fly to God himself to pray. But until then, I don't know God. Bury me and then rise up and break apart your chains. And with the enemy's black blood, confirm your liberty. And in that great community, a family new and free with calm and quiet words also remember me. It uses a lot of archetypes here, you know, this notion of being part of the landscape, not just hearing it and seeing it, the hearing the the Dnieper River, and um, because at the rapids, it does, it it, it was, we don't know it now because it's been, you know, it's been bounded and has been turned into, uh, the rapids have been extinguished uh, by the, uh, um, the, you know, this this film by... uh, who was it? Not Pudovkin, I forget now. Vertov, maybe. Uh, God, you know, the 11th year. You know, this is a monument to Soviet, um, um, uh, you know, 
massive construction of hydroelectric dams and all. So the rapids are no longer visible. But anyway, the, the, he, he is setting himself into that, that he is part of the land. And um, when that land f- leaches out the blood of enemies, as he says, then will I depart to God himself. But until then, I, I don't know God. And then, of course, this invocation that bury me and rise up and break apart your chains. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's, um, it's a remarkable, you know, statement of, uh, of uh, if you will, revolutionary thinking. The Soviets insisted on that. You know, they insisted on calling him a revolutionary Democrat, uh, as if by p- applying a label, you could uh, exhaust the, uh, the, the nuances. I don't think that that's necessarily the case here. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, uh, I don't know if I've done justice by t- to, to to talk about this poem. Uh, 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 you know, it's uh, it's um, um, it, the, the, it's a miniature, but one that is uh, that is uh, presumably resonant still to this day. You translated it uh, metrically, more or less. Uh, so, uh, do, do you is it the intention that the, these will be the English words to the uh, to the sung version? I felt that, you know, Stanislav Baranchuk, um, my uh, colleague here at Harvard for a long time, now deceased, very fine poet and translator, and a very fine scholar too, wrote uh, when he talked about translating poetry, that it is a kind of, a, you know, an, 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 an unreachable, almost Sisyphean goal, you know. You, uh, you cannot do everything that you feel you must do, uh, but you try to do as much as you can. And by the way, his and Seamus Heaney's translation of Kochanowski's Trenne is a masterpiece of translation of Kochanowski yes. into English. Just wonderful poetry. Mm-hmm. And uh, it works because two very fine poets were working at it, you know. And I'm not enough of a poet, perhaps, but I certainly have tried to do it also in a kind of a way that conveys the poetic component and not just the uh, the, uh, the semantic uh, content, because uh, a poem obviously is much more than just that. So let me ask you to to you know to conclude. Um, many of the uh, of our viewers are uh, undergraduates who are considering um, advanced study in uh, in Slavic uh, Slavic studies. Um, and could you say a few words about uh, Ukrainian at Harvard and the Harvard Ukrainian Institute? I, I hope that the uh, that this um, dreadful war will also give rise to a kind of a rethinking about priorities for people who are interested in Slavic. And even if they're interested in Russian, they should also make every effort to also learn Ukrainian because uh, with that, and I have had several students at the very, especially at the very end of my career when teaching at Harvard, uh, which uh, I I benefited very much from. And I uh, think that they benefited too, because I think that uh, uh, usually the natural counterpart to or antipode to Russian when people do a Slavic major is Polish, because that is a Western Slavic uh, tradition. Uh, they uh, uh, they um, have obviously uh, a different trajectory. Uh, po- Polish literature has a different trajectory, and um, uh, or or Czech. I would also urge them to consider Ukrainian because it has a very rich and highly dynamically developing, um, especially in the period after independence. Um, so now it is, uh, in, in terms of dimension, in terms of various various um, sort of issues addressed and uh, works, uh, written um, very rich in, in, in the flourishing literature, and uh, um, it is something that is worth our attention. I um, I can't predict any more than that. Um, obviously, it is our task to um, do our best in in uh, in, in these kinds of uh, ev- events and these kinds of uh, 
gatherings to um, to persuade our readers and to persuade our listeners that, that this is something that they should be interested in. Well, thank you very much for joining me on Encounters with Polish, and we're calling it Encounters with Polish and Ukrainian literature while we're uh, while we're covering Ukrainian topics. Um, it's been great to meet you uh, this way. Thank you. Don't go away. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications about new videos from the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Go to the Polish Cultural Institute's website linked in the description below to see a full schedule of upcoming and past episodes. Stay tuned for the credits for some recommendations about how you can support humanitarian aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. I'd like to thank all the people who helped make this series possible. The Polish Cultural Institute New York sponsors our program. Bartek Remisko, head of the Humanities and Literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, suggested this series and is our executive producer. My fellow producer, Natalia Iudin, handles all the video editing, technical and aesthetic aspects of this production. Claudia Ofwana Draber, head of communications at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, keeps us all informed about upcoming episodes of Encounters with Polish Literature and other events organized by the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. Let's meet again in a month when we'll discuss one of the most popular Polish novelists of the last century that you've never heard of, The Career of Nicodemus Dysma by Tadeusz Dołęga Mostowicz, thought to be the source of Jerzy Koszynski's novel, Being There. Yeah, I know you call him Jerzy Kaczynski. And we'll meet with the novel's translators, Eva Małachowska-Pasek and Megan Thomas. See you then.